Hey, welcome back. If you're a long time follower, you might have seen me build this thing here about three years ago. This is a hand operated bicycle crane that I built to replace those pesky bike work stands that I've always found pretty annoying to use, especially with heavy bikes like electric bikes or cargo bikes. The final product turned out to be quite useful, but I think this concept still has a lot of potential to be even better and I've had this idea to make an improved electric version of the crane for a long time, so that's what we're going to do today. The old crane is still in use in my shop, but there's a few things that always bugged me about it. Mainly the fact that you need to weigh it down so it doesn't tip over, and also that it's still kind of awkward to position the bike in the holding clamp because the clamp itself is pretty big and clunky and gets in the way and adjusting the position can also be more user friendly but on the positive side the ratchet mechanism still works great and it's a big help to not have to lift the heavy bikes. So having learned a few things building the first crane I came up with a new design which looks like this. So the principle is quite similar. The new crane also has a carriage with a lifting arm that rides up and down on a piece of tubing but everything is much more heavy duty to support more weight and the main difference is that the new crane is installed securely in one place but it can still be moved around and installed anywhere else in the shop without bolting anything to the floor or the ceiling and that's what this contraption on top is for. Uh, this has a large screw that can extend in and out and it works just like an inverted clamp by wedging the crane in between the floor and the ceiling of my shop. And thanks to this, the crane doesn't need a huge base plate or any weights to keep it from falling over, so it actually takes up less space than the old one. Instead of using a hand operated mechanism, this time the carriage will be pulled from the bottom using an electric winch that's going to be installed to the base plate here, and then the cable runs over these guide rollers on top, goes back down, and then connects to the carriage. Another important addition is that instead of having two steel tubes sliding over each other, this time the carriage rides on heavy-duty ball bearings to reduce the friction when pulling heavy loads. The other new feature is a heavy-duty lifting arm that has three movable joints which offer a huge degree of movement over multiple axes and what this allows you is to easily align the holding claw to any bike without having to actually move the bike around at all. So instead of trying to position an unwieldy cargo bike in the claw, the claw simply comes to the bike. Speaking of the claw, I thought about building one myself again, but there's some excellent bike holding claws on the market, so this time I just bought one. This one is the ParkTool 100 3D claw. I'm not sponsored by ParkTool, I just think this is a very good product. It's very robust and high quality, and even though it's not cheap, I don't think I could make a better claw myself with the amount that this costs. Here's the winch again that I'm going to use. This is just a cheap generic winch I bought on eBay. It plugs into a normal outlet and it's rated for 125 kilograms, which should be more than enough for lifting most bags, but the crane would work with almost any winch as long as it's strong enough. By the way, I once again made a set of plans for this build that includes all the measurements you need to replicate this as well as the material and parts list, so if you're interested in that, just check the link in the description. Before we start the build, here's the main materials for this project laid out. It's mostly just steel flat bar in various sizes, as well as some steel tubing and some plates. These are the side plates for the carriage, and I got a bit lazy this time, so I had these laser cut beforehand, but it's essentially just two rectangles with a bunch of holes in them, with these side cutouts being purely for looks. So I figured you're not missing much by not seeing me make these myself. Speaking of making, let's finally start building the crane. I'm going to start on the bottom and make this base plate and the mounting sleeve for the column first. I bought the base plate already cut to the right size, so all I need to do is clean it up a little bit and drill the mounting holes for the winch. I'm putting a pretty large chamfer on all the edges here because the plate's going to be sitting on the ground and I'm hoping this will avoid you uh, getting your shoes caught on it. I 
I want these screws to sit flush with the bottom of the plate when it's on the ground, so they all need to be countersunk. With the plate done, I can make the mounting sleeve, which consists of four sides and four gussets. I have a cutoff of the same 80 by 80 tubing that will be used for the column just to check the fit and make alignment a little easier. And the new welding table is coming in handy again here to keep this in place. I don't want this fit to be super tight since it's really just there to keep the column in position. So I'm putting in some shims before welding just in case it shrinks down. With this all tacked into place, I can now position it on the base plate. Where exactly this needs to sit depends on the winch you're using. In my case, I'm going to offset it to the side because I want the column to be in line with the drum where the cable comes out. And here I'm using a ton of clamps for tacking this up because I want to keep the base plate from warping too much. Welding stuff to plates is always tricky since they really like to warp. I didn't fully weld every joint here because this is extremely overbuilt as it is and I didn't want to put even more heat into this plate. With the base done we can move on to the top portion of the column starting with these supports for the cable pulleys. As with almost everything I buy, I found these on eBay with the ball bearings already installed. But you can probably find something similar at the hardware store or even make them yourself if you have a lathe. Now I need to create a cutout in the tubing for the column that these will fit in. And the easiest way to do this would be to just use an angle grinder. But as you know, I like to make things complicated for the sake of a nicer result. So I decided to do this on the milling machine. I can't fit this huge piece of tubing sideways, but I found a way to make it work. I have this other vise here which fits perfectly into the vise that's already installed. And by putting these together I was able to hold one end of the tubing in the mill. And then I just cut a wooden board to the right size and attached it to the walling table to hold it level on the other side. It's probably a great setup to trigger the trolls, but in my book, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. As sketchy as it looks, this actually worked perfectly to produce an accurate cutout and I think it didn't even take that much longer than using an angle grinder would have. Next up is this little assembly which consists of a plate, a piece of tubing and an M36 nut that we're all gonna weld up into one piece. For some reason my hole spacing on the part this connects to was off from what it was in the plant, so instead of figuring out the right position, 
Um, I got a bit lazy and just cut some slots to make sure it fits. Even with this plate being quite small, it distorted from the welding heat, like I mentioned earlier. It's not really an issue, and you could easily just install it like this, but since it only takes a few minutes, I decided to face it flat on the light. So that's how these parts go together and now we can insert this whole thing into the tubing and align the top plate to be on center and then the cable support can be welded in. Next part is the clamping screw, which consists of a threaded spindle and a separate plate that can turn independently from the spindle. And it's designed this way so that when you tighten the screw, you're not working against the friction being created between the ceiling and the steel plate. To make the spindle, I'm just going to use a piece of M36 all thread that I'm going to modify a little bit on the lathe. The groove I'm cutting in here will interface with two grub screws that keep the spindle and the plate together, but it's actually not strictly needed since the plate can't really go anywhere once the crane is set up. The spindle also gets a hole in the center and this is to insert a piece of round stock to use that as a handle. Now I'm making a ring that the spindle fits into, that I'll then weld onto a steel disc. And I'm going overboard as usual because you don't really need a machined fit for this, so a matching piece of tube would also work. To spare me the work of cutting this disc out, I also bought this as it is and I'm facing this on the lathe, mostly just because it's a convenient way to get rid of the mill scale. And while I was at it, I just put a little groove there so I can easily align the ring to be on center. As expected, this plate also warped quite a bit. Once again, it's not strictly necessary, but I decided to face the other side flat.
Now that all the parts for the clamping assembly are finished, I'm going to put these together and do a test installation for the crane column. So the tubing now simply slides into the sleeve. It has a little play, which is fine because you don't want it to get jammed in there. So I got a thread into the rear plate just to keep it from wobbling until it's wedged under the ceiling. Now I can position this under one of these concrete ceiling beams. I cut out this disc from a thick rubber mat. Since this is quite thick, it will conform to any surface roughness on the ceiling and also increase friction and it also protects the ceiling so the clamp won't leave any marks. So now I just extend the screw out and tighten it using a piece of round bar and you can also screw on this counter nut for additional safety but I actually don't think it's really necessary. I was actually surprised by this first test because I wasn't sure if this was even going to work at first but it turned out to be rock solid. I can pull on this with my entire weight and kick it pretty hard and it barely moves at all. So I think it's extremely unlikely that this will ever tip over. Now that the rest is finished we can make the carriage. Like I said, the side plates have already been laser cut, but they are still missing some small threads on the side, which are going to allow adjustment of two of the axles. After some cleanup, there is one more addition, which is a locking screw to lock the carriage on the column. You might be thinking, why didn't I just cut a thread right into the plate instead of welding on this threaded puck? But there's a reason for that too. I don't want to have a clamping screw directly pushing against the column and potentially putting a dent in it. So to spread out the pressure over a larger area, I had this hole cut into the plate to house this little aluminum disc. So the locking screw is going to push against this disc, which is going to push against the tubing instead of contacting the tubing directly. I'm not doing full welds here because it's not necessary and I really want to avoid warping this plate. Next I'm going to make the axles and to keep it simple this is just 12mm cold rolled steel so it's dimensionally accurate enough to fit into the bearings meaning the only thing I have to do is cut some threads into the ends. We're also gonna need a few spacers and I'm just using some stainless tubing cut to the right length for that. The only thing missing for the carriage now is this part which is quite beefy because it holds all the weight and it's just three pieces of flat bar welded together. To make sure this all stays properly aligned, I'm clamping a piece of square stock in between these parts that has the same size as the tubing that will go in here later. This was pretty tricky to weld on the inside because I didn't want to remove the square bar and risk these plates becoming too tight in the center. So I had to try and squeeze the torch in there somehow, which resulted in some ugly welds, but at least the outside ones came out pretty nice. And I think it actually paid off, because the spacing came out perfect and the part stayed square. Now it just needs a few holes. I drilled these after welding to make sure they are aligned with each other, but I later used a different method for the arm joints, which are up next. 
these are fairly simple just some 60 by 60 tubing with these tabs welded on at the end and a hole on the other end These round rovers I'm grinding actually serve a purpose because they increase the maximum movement radius of the arm segments by quite a bit. Here are the pieces for those tabs. Again, it's just some flat bar that I refined a little bit on the belt grinder. I also decided to put in these round tubes on the end. I figured these might help to further stiffen out the ends of the tubing. They're probably not necessary, but it's easy to do and it won't hurt anything. In this case, I can just use one piece to align the other one, which made putting these together quite easy. I obviously can't weld these from the other side, but they really just need to stay in place to do their job, so two small welds should be enough. The last part we have to make is this clamp that holds the claw, that holds the bike, and this claw is designed to interface with a 50mm tube. This is a piece of 60 by 6 mm steel tubing, which has an ID of 48 mm so that I can bore it out on the lathe to 50 for a nice fit. But in retrospect, just buying a seamless 60 by 5 steel tube that already has a 50 mm ID would probably have been easier, and this way you wouldn't need a lathe. Now that we have a good fit, I'm going to make two cylinders, one for the axle and one that will become the clamping nut. I needed to cut a 58mm miter into this part, and this is actually a 57mm hall saw. But the runout is so bad on it that it happened to produce a perfect 58mm fit. Yes, I could have used a boring head for this, but this was fast and easy, so why not? To fit this sleeve for the axle into the clamp, I need to drill two holes. These annular drills actually don't like interrupted cuts. I think they're designed to cut into flat surfaces only, so this produced a lot of chatter and I'm probably going to get some hate for this in the comments, but it did leave a very nice and accurate hole regardless. With the sleeve in place, I'm using the welding table to align the clamping nut parallel to it, and then I can weld this in place.
this tube here really just needs to stay in place, so two small welds is all it needs. Last thing to do is to make some straight cuts so that the clamp actually becomes functional. These big slitting saws often wobble a little bit and the runout is pretty bad on this one, but it actually cuts just fine, it just means the cut is going to be a little wider, which doesn't matter in this case. You do need a bit of patience with these, since they have a tendency to jam if you go too fast, and you can actually stall this machine with a tool this large. Hopefully we can all just ignore the fact that it looks like a minion. The last cut left a tiny wipe at the end, since I couldn't go in any further with the slitting saw, but this was easy enough to finish with a small hacksaw and some filing. Now I just need to open up the hole on one side and tap the other side, and with that the clamp is, spoiler alert, almost finished. With the clamp done, it's time to assemble everything. So here's all the parts laid out, but before I do that, there's a few more minor things to address. You saw me install the column between the floor and the bottom of this concrete support earlier, but I eventually changed my mind and decided to extend the crane to give me a little bit more travel upwards, so I need to add about 30 centimeters to the column. So I just welded an extension piece onto the bottom of the column, and of course I had to grind the welds flush so that the carriage doesn't get stuck on them. And I also decided to paint the bottom part to hide my grimes a little bit. I also painted the base because I didn't feel like cold bluing a part this large, which is what I'm going to do to the rest of them. But before that I cleaned up some of the remaining mill scale in the blast cabinet and buffed up the clean surfaces. I once again used cold blue as a finish for most of the moving parts, followed by a generous coating of WD-40. And with that I can finally put everything together, starting with the carriage. Now you can see why two of the axles sit in these slots. Using the small head screws, these can be adjusted back and forth. Since the whole thing is a sandwich construction, these axles are slightly shorter than the overall width of the carriage, which means when you tighten the screws outside, it squeezes the entire assembly together, securing the side place, bearings and spacers in position. This part here could be welded in. But I like to keep things serviceable and allow the option of fixing or changing things and with the screwed connection you also don't have to deal with the welding distortion. Before installing the winch I had to make some changes to it. On the end of the cable there's this disc which normally triggers the end stop but it serves no purpose in this design and gets in the way of the carriage so I had to remove it and the easiest way was to just cut it off. Then I just put in a new loop using some rope clips. Someone is most likely gonna tell me I'm using these wrong and I'm gonna die, but so far this has been holding up just fine. 
The other change was to extend the control cable, which was way too short. So I installed a new cable and I only happen to have a white one, just in case you're wondering. Now the winch can be installed onto the base and then I can just place the base on the ground. Since you can't put it on from the top, there's now two ways to install the carriage. One is to assemble it on the column, which I imagine would be kind of a pain. So the easier way I've found is to place the assembled carriage on the ground, then insert the column into it, and then you can pull up the carriage itself and lock it, and actually use it as a handle to lift the column into the base, which is otherwise quite awkward to hold on to. And then we can move on to the top, but before there's another small thing, I decided to refine that rough rubber disc a little bit by making it round on the belt grinder. I've never used this on rubber, but it seems to work just fine. And I'm going to attach this to the finished clamping disc. Now the spindle can be installed using some grease to reduce the friction between these parts. Now the cable pulleys can be installed and the cable gets put over them and then the clamping assembly gets installed on top of that and the clamping screw can be tightened. With all that done, we can finally marry the winch to the carriage and release the locking screw. Now I can adjust the two moving axles to minimize the play between the carriage and the column. And there's a reason for how these are positioned, because when there's a load applied to the crane arm, it's going to pull one of these axles forward and push the other one against the column, meaning these two axles share most of the load, while the other two are more or less idle and are mostly just there to keep the whole thing in place. So that's why these are the movable axles, because otherwise all that force would be pushing against these two little set screws. I can just screw in these head screws to push the bearings against the column until it's tight but not too tight and then by tightening the screws on the side the whole thing gets locked into position. Now the lifting arm can be installed and you can actually take out or add arm segments depending on the use case since all of these connections are the same. Originally I was going to use these plastic handles for the two joints in the middle, but I got a bit carried away and machined these fancy aluminum knobs off camera. At this point I realized there was a bit of an oversight on my part because once you unlock this clamp, not only can the claw rotate, which I want, but it can also slide out, which I don't want. If you install this into a park tool workstand, it gets secured from the back, but since that is impossible in this case, I'm going to modify the claw a little bit. The back of it is just a steel cylinder, and by the way, this looks like a CNC machine, solid piece of steel, which really speaks for the quality of this claw. And thanks to that I can just machine a groove into it and use the same principle I used on the clamping disc on top of the crane to keep it from sliding out of the clamp. So the clamp gets a small additional thread. And then a grub screw with some Loctite will keep the claw from sliding out while still allowing this to rotate freely.
And with that, we're finally finished, so we can start giving this a test drive. This is how far it can go up in my shop, which is about 220 centimeters from the claw to the ground, which should be plenty to work on bikes, but if you have a room with taller ceilings, it obviously could go up even higher. One nice thing about the winch solution is that as soon as you touch the bottom, there's no risk of crushing anything because the cable simply goes loose. Which is great because it also means you can't accidentally crush a bike against the ground when you lower the crane. Another thing I like about this is that you can sort of wrap the arm around the column to put this into a parking position. And even with how beefy it is, it now has a very small footprint in the shop and actually takes up less than half the space compared to my old crane. So let's test this on some actual bikes now. You probably thought I'd ride something fancy, but this speeder is pretty much my daily ride because it just works and looks rough enough not to get stolen immediately. Like I said in the beginning, there's no more need to align the bike to the crane in any way because the holding claw just extends out and aligns itself to the bike. And you actually don't even need to lock these joints down before lifting with the exception of the claw rotation. Because this bike isn't really a challenge for the crane, but we're going to move up to some heavier stuff in a second. Another thing that's very handy when working on bikes is that you can swing the arm around in almost any direction, so there's less walking around and no need to reclamp the bike if, for example, you need to reach the other side. I'm going to put the claw on the seat post to create some additional leverage, and even with this bike being fairly front heavy, it's again not creating any issues. So let's do some stress testing. Some of you may remember this gigantic vise from one of my recent videos. This is still waiting for a restoration, but actually I already put it on the crane scale when I restored the other vise. So I know that this weighs almost 60 kilograms. But the crane doesn't even flinch trying to lift this, so I figured I'd try being extra mean and moving the crane arm over to the side which removes load from the bearings and places it on the side plates, creating more friction, but even this works just fine, although I don't recommend using the crane this way all the time. And if you still had any doubts about this not being secure or underpowered, I'm a fairly heavy guy and I can use it as an elevator. You can hear the winch is starting to break a sweat here, but I'm not trying to test the winch but rather how well the crane itself holds up, and I'd say it's doing pretty well. Now let's try a cargo bike. You might have seen me build this one in one of my older videos. This is fairly light for a cargo bike, although it has gotten a bit heavier over the years because I switched out some parts, and it now comes in at almost exactly 18 kilos. On a regular bike stand, you'd now have to lift this into the claw and then try awkwardly closing the claw with one hand. But here I just park it roughly in front of the crane. And without moving the bike at all, the claw can reach the top tube, the steering tube and even the seat tube. The next example is a very common cargo bike. This is a Bullet by a company called Larry vs. Harry. I know some people mistakenly assume that I somehow invented cargo bikes, but outside of the US they are actually extremely common and this is one of the most popular commercial models you can buy. This is not my bike by the way, I borrowed this from a friend just for the video and it's a fairly heavy Bullet with a large box mounted to it, so let's find out the weight first. This comes in at almost 40 kilos, and due to the box being in the way, there's not too many good clamping options available here, but I eventually figured the best place to attach the claw is on the steering tube.
Lifting this with the claw works just fine, but I'm already thinking of building some additional attachments for the crane arm, which are better suited to lift this style of bike compared to a single clamp. Last but not least, we got this monstrosity. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about this bike, but as much as I'd like to get into it, it's just beyond the scope and topic of this video. I'm just gonna say this was built way before I was making YouTube videos and it has a lot of history. And although it looks kind of ridiculous, it's actually quite useful. For example, I moved apartments without having to rent a truck, thanks to this thing. But I had no idea how much this actually weighs and it turned out to be even heavier than I thought at 66 kilos. Now the weight isn't a problem, but obviously lifting something this huge is not really practical with this crane. I just kind of felt like throwing it in there just to show it's possible. That should be enough examples for now. I think this crane will come in very handy in the future for all kinds of things. And as you probably guessed from the build, I'm planning on finally building some bikes again soon. So subscribe if you haven't yet. And thanks for watching and see you next time.